All right, in this lecture, we will discuss Financing Real Property, Chapter 9 of your textbook. We're going to start with some definitions first. When you purchase real property, unless you use all cash, there is typically a secure loan involved. A secure loan is one where the lender gives the borrower money and the borrower puts up the house or the land as collateral. This allows the buyer to take possession of the land. And then the lender is given a security instrument that is proof of the lender's security interest in the land. Then, if the borrower doesn't pay their loan as agreed, the lender can take the house using the security instrument and sell the house to satisfy the unpaid amount that is left on the loan. So that is a very high level overview of how secure transactions work and why we have secured loans. So in a secured loan transaction, you will have a document called a promissory note. And you can think of it as evidencing the buyer's obligation to pay. A promissory note is a special type of contract that's called a negotiable instrument. A negotiable instrument has special power in contract law because it can be transferred or sold. So to qualify as a negotiable interest, it needs to be a written, signed document that promises the holder unconditionally to pay them a sum of money. The person who signs the note, the one who promises to make payments, is called the maker. And they promise to make payments to the holder. Now the holder can be the initial person who is named on that instrument, or it can be an assignee or somebody that that holder assigns the interest in. A promissory note is a type of negotiable interest. Now, there are um, other types of negotiable instruments. Sorry, that should say instruments, not uh, interest. Promissory note is a negotiable instrument. There are other types of negotiable instruments. You may be familiar with checks. Those are negotiable instruments as well. And we said, again, what's special about negotiable instruments is that the uh, the holder can assign or sell their interest um, to receive payments. All right, some typical clauses that are found in promissory notes, particularly in relation to land. You usually find something called an acceleration clause. An acceleration clause says that if a payment is missed, or a certain number of payments is missed on the loan, then the holder can accelerate the entire amount that is due and make it due immediately. So an acceleration cause accelerates the loan to the end and says the entire remaining balance is due. An acceleration clause um, happens on certain events, a certain number of missed payments usually. A due on sale clause is a clause in the promissory note that requires that if the property is sold, the full remaining loan amount is due on the sale of the property. We'll talk about what that means as far as um, real property sales in a minute. 
There are also typically some non-monetary uh, obligations that are included in notes. Uh, for example, there can be requirements that um, the maker um, not waste or cause damage to the property or that they carry homeowner's insurance. Okay, so that is the promissory note. That is the negotiable instrument that promises that the maker will make payments to the lender. The promissory note is accompanied by a security instrument. The security instrument is an additional contract that provides the remedy for the breach or the default on the note. So the promissory note is secured by the security instrument. The security instruments are recorded against the property of interest. Why? Well, the holder of the security instrument has a security interest in the property. This interest encumbers the property. And remember, when title is exchanged from person to person, they need to, the, the buyer needs to be put on notice of all potential encumbrances on the property. Well, this is an encumbrance. And we'll talk later about why it needs to be recorded aside from putting the buyer notice on notice. Um, it also serves as a protection for the interests of the holder. Okay, so when you finance land purchases, you usually have a promissory note and a security instrument. Now that security instrument can be a mortgage or a deed of trust. Well, how do you decide which security instrument you use? Well, states will have adopted one form or the other. So states will either be mortgage states or deed of trust states. Now, another possibility is that the promissory note is included in or accompanied by an installment land contract. And usually, in this case, the promissory note is included in the installment land contract. Another option which we will talk about is what if you have a promissory note, but you don't have a written agreement that is a security instrument, but your understanding is that it was going to be handled um, like a mortgage? Well, in cases like that, courts may find an equitable mortgage. So we're going to talk about what that is a little bit later. I just want to present the concepts to you. Um, together and then we'll talk about um, some of these examples. Okay. All right, so a typical transaction, you have a buyer and a seller. And let's say the buyer, the buyer is paying all cash uh, for this house. And so in this case, the seller will give the buyer title to the house when the buyer delivers the purchase price to the seller. It's pretty simple. This is what happens when there's an all cash offer. Most um, real property purchases are not all cash offers. So what happens then? What happens if there's a third party lender involved? Well, So if there is a third party lender, we still have the purchase price um, that needs to be paid to the seller. We have a promissory note and a security instrument that's given from the buyer to the lender. So, so really you start, the buyer gives the lender a promissory note and a security instrument. Then the lender gives a purchase price to the seller. The seller then has to 
give the title to somebody. So who gets the title, the lender or the buyer? It depends on if you are in a mortgage or a deed of trust state. If you are in a mortgage state, the buyer transfers the promissory, you know, executes the promissory note and um, the security instrument, which is going to be a mortgage in this case, to the lender. The lender gives the purchase price to the seller and the seller gives the title to the lender. Now, what legal significance or practical significance does this have? Well, in a mortgage state, the buyer still takes possession of the property and still has equitable ownership in the property. But legal title is with the lender. In a mortgage state, foreclosures are done through the judiciary system. They're called judicial foreclosures. So we're going to talk about foreclosures a little bit later. I just wanted to mention that difference here. Some states don't use mortgages. They use what are called deeds of trust. And the documents are very similar. Um, and there is a legal difference that affects how foreclosures are done, or at least justifies um, that foreclosures are done differently in deed of trust states. Okay, in a deed of trust state, you still have um, the lender supplying the purchase price, the buyer supplying a promissory note and a security instrument, and the seller um, having title, right? So in this case, the buyer is providing to the lender a promissory note and the security instrument, which is the deed of trust, the purchase price goes to the lender. But rather than give the lender the title, the seller gives the title to a third party trustee. And that trustee holds on to the title until the buyer either pays off um, that satisfies the promissory note, or if the lender needs to foreclose on the property, the foreclosure can be done without the judicial system. And it is done, it's a non-judiciary foreclosure. It is done in a trustee sale, right? So the idea with a deed of trust is the title is held in trust with a trustee. And because it is held by a third party in trust, the thought is that the sale can be done by the trustee without having to get the judicial system involved. And so that's why a little bit later when we talk about non-judicial foreclosures, this diagram makes it easier to then understand why in deed of trust states they have allowed for non-judicial foreclosures because the idea that the title is held by a third party, not the bank, and therefore the third party can foreclose um, on the interest for the bank. We're going to talk about one more security instrument, and that is an installment contract for the purchase of, of land. So here, again, the seller has the title to the property, right? And that is, we said, what buyers are purchasing. They're purchasing the title, which um, gives them ownership to land, right? And there is no lender in this, or there's no third-party lender. It is a seller financed sale. The seller is financing the sale. And the seller keeps the title. Let's say that there's three installments on this contract. So the buyer pays installment number one, the seller still keeps the title. The buyer pays installment number two, the seller keeps the title. Let's say that the buyer here does not, is not able to make the third installment. 
misses the deadline to make the third installment. Well, the law, well, the, the contract, the installment contract usually contain, contains what is called a forfeiture clause. And the forfeiture clause allows the seller to keep installment one and two in the title if the buyer misses any of their payments. So let's say the buyer makes all of their payments, they make their third payment, then the title is transferred from the seller to the buyer. Okay, so as you can um, imagine, uh, this type of financing can have some dire consequences for buyers because if they miss one payment, they lose uh, any, they, they don't, they're not building equity in the house, right? They don't get title or any ownership until all installments have been paid. And we talked about what the forfeiture clause is. It allows the seller to keep all of the installment payments and keep title to the property. However, the forfeiture clause is not always um, seen as, um, as fair by even the courts. And so in the next case, Stone v. Calhoun, uh, you're presented with a court of appeals decision from Kentucky where the court felt that the forfeiture provision in the installment contract was um, not enforceable because public policy reasons amongst others. I want to briefly talk about what happens to uh, a note and the security instrument when the property is sold. When property is sold, uh, the new purchaser, the buyer, can do one of two things. They can take title to the property and assume well, first of all, the, the, the seller can satisfy the mortgage, right? Pay the mortgage off with the proceeds of the sale. And that's typically what happens. If the seller doesn't do that, however, the purchaser can either assume the debt or take subject to the debt. If the purchaser assumes the debt, then they assume the loan and they are personally liable for the loan. If the buyer takes subject to the loan, then they're not personally liable for the loan. But if payments are not made by the loan holder, then the lender can foreclose on the property and that can eliminate the buyer's interest. Okay, so let's say A sells property to B and the property that A sells, Greenacre, has a note recorded on it. And so B agrees to take the property subject to that lien, that lender's interest. Okay. Well, as long as A keeps making the payments on the loan, then there won't be an issue. But if A defaults on the loan, the lender can foreclose on Green Anchor, even though Green Anchor is now owned by B. And so I already previewed this a little bit. Um, we talked about foreclosure. So what can happen if there are missed payments? Well, the lender has the right to sell the property in certain circumstances and recoup their loan, okay? So if it is a mortgage state that happens through a judicial foreclosure, so the lender files an action in the court and there's a judicial foreclosure. If this happens in a deed of trust state, then it is a non-judiciary foreclosure. The trustee forecloses on the property for the lender. If there is a missed payment with an installment land contract, we are to discuss forfeiture clause then the seller gets to keep all of the installment payments that have come in and they get to keep the title. And can also sue the buyer for breach of contract. 
Now we're going to talk about um, in the next lecture foreclosure in more detail um, or what the lender can do if there is a missed payment. But I just wanted to give you this overview um, before we moved on. So we said that when you finance land purchases, it can be done with, it's always done with a promissory note and some type of security interest. And that security interest can either be a mortgage or a deed of trust, depending on the state. We also said that at times there are installment land contracts in which the seller is financing the property. But what happens if you only have a promissory note and there is not a written security agreement? Well, you might have something called an equitable mortgage, which is what the court in Zeman v. Felton found. So with an equitable mortgage, um, it is viewed as a mortgage. Um, the court concludes that it's a mortgage in substance, even if there isn't a written agreement. And so as a result, uh, the seller and the buyer will have the rights that they would under a mortgage. Um, so in Zeman and Felton, the court adopts an eight-factor standard to determine what an equitable mortgage is. And you can find that standard on page 662. Um, I think that for exam purposes, if it would be just important to mention that there might be an equitable mortgage if there is an oral um, an oral agreement that uh, is similar to a mortgage. And if you find uh, facts that resemble this eight-factor test, you can argue that they are uh, they would likely be persuasive to the court. So you'll find the, the test on page 662. I'm not going to go into it in, in detail. And the thing to remember about equitable mortgages is if that you have an oral agreement that, um, that has the elements of a mortgage or a deed of trust, you may have an equitable mortgage. Because, again, remember deeds of trust and mortgages all need to be in writing um, per the statute of frauds rule. So if it's not, this is a possible equitable solution that can be sought by the parties. And that's going to be the end for this segment. We'll continue on with foreclosures next.